I'm going to open this up in a prayer real quick. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to come together to study your word, Lord, to, to get to know you, to understand you, Lord. We come together to seek your face and to seek your will, Lord. I pray that we will take what we learned today and measure ourselves against it. I pray that we will study the, study your word to better understand what we have learned today. And I pray that we will go forth and use it in our lives to spread your good news. And I pray that people will see it in our lives and witness it and ask the question, why are they different? And I pray that we have enough courage and boldness to tell them that it's you. That's why we are different, Lord. We thank you. And we, we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so last week, I forgot to introduce myself. So some of you don't know who I am. I am Jason Smith. And I'm not Pastor Jason. For those of you who know Pastor Jason, you know that. But some may not. And I apologize, sometimes I uh, forget things. Just, I assume everybody else forgets things, maybe not. <laughs> so, we've been going through uh, a book by Mark Dever called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And the one that we've been studying against is the third edition. There is a fourth edition, and there are some differences. So if you purchase the fourth edition and you're studying it, there's going to be some differences. They can change the, uh, basically the whole outline of how it flows. We might get to go over some of the extra content that's in the fourth edition. I don't know that, but there have been some talk about trying to include that, but I imagine it depends on you know, how much time each lesson takes and whether we have time to get it in. <coughs> So I'm going to take a few minutes and review what we went over last week. There are some people who were not here last week, so we'll go over that real quick. We uh, went over, there are five bullet points that Mark uses to go over the third mark, which is what we're studying, the gospel. We went over the first three last week, and I'll review those now. And we may or may not finish the, the final two. I would think there's going to be more discussion in those two, and hopefully at the end, and we'll just have to see how that goes. I'm, 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 I'm thankful for discussion. I appreciate your guys' input, questions, concerns, and insight. And that kind of goes back to a thought I had when I first uh, was approached to present this mark, the Gospels. Either that's going to be the easiest mark to present to you guys, or it's going to be the most difficult. Because you guys know it very well, I'm certain of it. So, hopefully uh, I make no mistakes, but I'm not guaranteeing that. <laughs> so last week we went over three, three of the bullet points. The good news is not simply that we are okay. And the good news is not simply that Jesus wants to be our friend. And the good news is not simply that God is love. Now, it's not simply that. On all those three, um, we're not simply okay. So we went over that. We Mark makes a very valid point that we are far from okay, especially apart from Christ. He expresses concerns that people will not receive the gospel if they don't understand their own brokenness. Mm. I mean, if it doesn't apply to them, it's, they're not going. It's, it's not good news. So. Why is the mentality of we are okay, why is that so dangerous? And this is a little bit of a review, so some of you may not participate in that. If you had some thoughts about that over the week, I'd appreciate that. So why, why is that dangerous? Why is it that if we, don't, if we don't present our brokenness, what problem is that? You don't deal with your sin. God's going to deal with it, right? And if we don't say that, you're not dealing with it. Right. 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 That's true. And that's a good point, Todd. The, uh, we, we can't deal with it. We can try, and we can try, and we can spend you know, our entire lives thinking that we've dealt with it, or that we can. And it's not happening. God's law proves that. 
There's no man apart from Christ who's ever successfully kept that law 100%. No way. And we all know if you break one, you've broken the all. So, good, good point there. Anybody else have any thoughts there? I think society really tells you today um, that you're okay, you're okay, and, and they want you to embrace that more and more, and um, they have their own reality, and they don't even see themselves as sinners. That's true. So it's totally contradictory to, to the Word of God, but how do you repent when you're perfect? Well, there's a, a level of perfectness that they can attain. Right. I like the, the phrase you use, they have their own reality. And that's true. We, we have to help them get past that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. If you think you're okay, it's only the same. Right. Exactly. And the good news is that we have been saved. So it means nothing without that. Yeah. yeah. Um, our enemy, the evil one, wants us to know that we're okay. That's a big push for him. Yeah. It is. He wants us to forget all about our sin. He wants us desperately to know that we're okay. Yep. We're close. If we don't think we're sinful, there's no way for us to repent, and that's part of salvation. The good news is not simply that God is love. We touched on that some. Uh, Mark drives home another mistake in some of the churches thinking about God is love. God is love, but why or how is God love? That gave his son part. That's huge. We were talking about that earlier before Sunday school that that is probably the best example of love that we'll ever find. And we really don't even understand that. If we think of that as giving our own children up as a sacrifice in that manner, it really isn't quite the same. We're talking about Christ. Perfect. Completely holy. Without sin entirely. The most innocent individual in human flesh. God gave us that. He gave us His Son. It's a big difference there. So that we have to contemplate on Christ's perfection. We have to think about that because that's a big part of our salvation. That's how the sacrificial system worked. And without that perfection and his death, there would be no absolving of our sin. Because we can't do it. We have no perfection. And we can't even keep the sacrificial system perfect in the wall. Yeah, so the love just goes deeper, too, because not only did he give us his son, and Jesus bore full-grown the Father's righteous wrath, but we deserve what we were given was righteousness. Right. An undeserving gift. Yes. Sometimes love is punishing those who we care deeply for. This is what we talked about last week. You know, we have to take care of that with our own kids. And we talked about how, you know, that Sometimes that child will say, you know, if you love me, you will let me whatever. Or you'll say yes to this. And every one of us has heard that. And we've felt that. We've seen that. Maybe not even have said those specific words, but that, that mentality has been presented from probably every one of our children at some point. Even, we even did it to our own parents because that's the our nature. You know, some sometimes... Love is allowing hardships, even though we have the power to stay that hardship or prevent it. Hardships teach a lesson. We are to go through some of those. We have trials. God allows these trials. The unbelieving world who don't understand these things, that's going to skew or even break their vision of God or their understanding of God. I mean, they're already struggling with it. So, if we just say, oh, God is love, and they apply that to the world's view of what love is, that's a, that's a problem. Yes, sir? So, uh, we can learn from Corinthians, verse 3, verse 13, that God describes love as He is. He's doing it as we live. This kind of patient bears all things, covers all things, forgives all things. So, that's the essence of God. 
You were right. <clears throat> Mark wants to make sure that we don't apply the, the world's view of love. And what's the what's one of the best ways to prevent that? What's the best way to correct that? <clears throat> That's correct. We have his God, we have it written down. Plus Christ came in and embodied it. We have that. It's written in our hearts. That's true. Especially if we have the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> It should be driving us. You know, sometimes I think we lose the concept of God and, and love. If my child was staying in front of a school bus, it was going to be a hit, I yanked him out of the way. Sometimes God places us in front of the school bus. So we do get hit. That's we right. go through that suffering. <clears throat> draws us to himself. And that's yes. love. It is. That, that's we we are uh, we are to bear children, and that's part of our our sin. We didn't have that. We didn't have that. Uh, if you want to call it a curse, then we didn't have that until we sinned. And God wanted us to understand what we did to Him, and we could we could see that through our own children. And we talked about that some last week. And. That's part of understanding is dealing with the same things or going through that that hardship because it helps us understand what we did, how we're wrong, and how broken we are. <clears throat> the good news is not simply that Jesus wants to be our friend. Jesus does want a personal relationship with every individual in here, but that's not all of the gospel. That's only a very small part of it. So what is at the center of Christ's ministry? <clears throat> we talked about that some. He wants us to repent. But Christ came to die. So in Mark 10, verse 45, he said, He did not come to be served, but to serve, and to die for the many. And all four gospels center on his death. And it's so hard to believe, even his own disciples didn't even understand, and he repeatedly told them, I'm here to die. I'm not here to rescue you from the Romans. I'm not here to be your mighty king with the with the power of God behind me. I'm here to die for you. Because our need is much greater there than it is for any of those other concerns. In our sin. Death is guaranteed. So we in our sin and without Christ are separated from life, from God. And God is holy. He has separated Himself from sin. And we're separated from Him through that. We're, we've separated ourselves from God through our sin because He is holy. And praise God for having the power and the love and the mercy to send his perfect son to die for us. And it's the final and most powerful sacrifice. Christ fulfilled the sacrificial system there in a way that it's impossible for us to even approach that. There's no way. So Christ does want to be our friend, but that is not the whole of the gospel. And it's dangerous if we don't present the sin aspects of why he truly came. If we leave that out, the unbeliever or the people who don't know, some people have a great knowledge of the Bible and they don't believe, but they don't have an understanding. And that will drive that misunderstanding further and it will deepen it. And it causes big problems. So... That was the three points from last week. <clears throat> we'll talk at the end a little bit about how we can look for that here and in our lives to make sure that we're meeting this third mark, the gospel, in its fullness. So we're going to continue with the final two. The good news is not simply that God will renew creation. It's not simply that. God is going to renew creation. We're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. 
He's going to destroy sin completely and it'll be gone and completely removed. But that's not what the gospel is simply. Deborah wrote, but there are a couple of correctives that we need to make sure are included in the story as it is so often recounted. First, in the most profound sense, we don't do the gospel. We proclaim it. Mm -hmm. And the gospel is news we proclaim not about what we're doing, but about what God has done, is doing, and will do. <coughs> At the same time, we're not called to enjoy the show like a kid with his nose pressed against the window at a candy shop. So, what are some way, What are some of the ways that we are commanded to participate in this and the bringing of God's kingdom? Philippians two says, "Work out your salvation in fear and trembling." It is I who work in you. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. But we're called to work out our own salvation and fear and trembling. Well, that's a good description of how we're supposed to participate, yes. I think we should all work together like a body, the body of Christ. That's very good. Paul, uh, as Paul mentions about their members of the body, each one has more of than the other one, the best one. All of them are combined. One suffers, and one has to go. And this is, we as members of Christ, we should support each other and refine each other, like iron sharpens iron. Yes. So keep ourselves in the world always, because we know one member by life one day might have any problems. So we need to support that person. That's so correct. Right. Paul says, "Judge, if God will judge the outside of the church, that we ourselves we are part of Christ. So we ourselves must must ensure that." each other sometimes. That's correct. So we are to stay together. We are to be together. Is the work the work of full sanctification working it out there? Oh yeah, that's a big part of it. Um, this is a very open-ended question. And there's many answers. And that's a big part of it. Actually, you know, sanctification is you know, the process in which we participate. That process is going to cause us to be a certain way to do certain things uh, to you know present the fruits of the Holy Spirit you know we've been called to be baptized um, we've been commanded to eat the bread and drink the wine at the Lord's Supper and that's us coming together and fellowshipping with each other supporting one another and even holding each other accountable we're to live new lives we are in creation. And if, if the world doesn't see the new creation, they're going to see the world's creation, the, the brokenness. They're not going to see God. <clears throat> We're to bear fruit. We all, have, we all have our gifts. And we're to use those to that end. You know, the, our evangelists, they'll go out and they'll proclaim the news to strangers. And then we have people who are you know, musically inclined, and they will help us come closer to God in our worship. And these things are fruits. Teachers can help us understand the Word of God better and to cause us to contemplate it in a different manner. Acknowledge Christ before men. We've been called to do that. We have the Great Commission. <coughs> We're to Go out and spread the good news and to make disciples of the earth. <coughs> that make disciples is a uh, very personal thing. Christ wasn't talking about preaching to big audiences in large stadiums. He was talking about individuals. We are to seek out individuals to help encourage and teach. Bring them in and support them and hold them accountable. And eventually they're going to hold you accountable because we're still broken. We still have the flesh. So the gospel isn't simply that God will renew creation. We're not to just sit and watch while the, uh, all this takes place. Proclaiming the gospel requires an action, a response. 
So for others to see the sincerity of our proclamation of the good news, they must see a new creation that's willing to work towards God's kingdom. They should see us toiling and making effort. We should want to. We should have that desire to love and to seek God's will in that. That should even be in our prayers. How can we help bring the kingdom of God? How can we not sit out? Yeah, I think like what you're touching on right now is, is uh, something that, you know, the verse that comes to my mind is, is prayer, well, for prayer. Um, Matthew 9, 38 and Luke 10, 2, he says the same thing. He says the, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray earnestly, therefore. Yes. The word of the harvest raises up laborers. It's got to start with praying that that people are ignited by the Holy Spirit. I believe. You know, it, it's, it's got to come from Him. But if He uses us as His students, yeah, he provides the work there. He, he provides the work, and we are to perform the work. And, that, and that's not just evangelizing. I think that's everything. That's it is. That's discipling. That's like personal growth, reaching people. I think it's got to start earnest prayer. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. We are co-laborers. So how sincere are we? Is this good news really profound to us? Is the world seeing that it's that profound? Mark's concern here is that it might not be. And we should look at that at the church level here locally. Look at our small groups, large groups that we participate in. Look at it as individuals. Deborah wrote... Any faithful presentation of the gospel cannot leave us passive. It cannot be mere recounting of God's story of action, leaving out how we, through the cross and resurrection of Christ, can enter that story. That's a great, a great bit there. That's, we are to enter that story. So the good news and our response. That's the fifth point that never goes over about the gospel. So we're going to talk about the good news and how we respond to it. We've touched on that a little bit already. But to quote Mark Dabber here, the good news is that the one and only God who is holy made us in his image to know him. But we sinned and cut ourselves off from him. In his great love, God became a man in Jesus, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross, thus fulfilling the law himself and taking on himself the punishment for the sins of all those who would ever turn and trust in him. He rose again from the dead, showing that God accepted Christ's sacrifice and that God's wrath against us had been exhausted. He ascended and presented his completed work to his heavenly Father. He now sends out his Spirit to call us through this message to repent of our sins and to trust in Christ. We are born again into a new life, an eternal life with God. Mark uh, clearly has been a great deal time to make sure that statement was very well thought out and inclusive of every parts of the gospel. In, in his third mark, he wants us to do the same. He wants us to apply that effort. He wants us to make sure we're not leaving anything out. We're, we're instructed not to leave anything out or to add to it. We're presented as it has been presented to us. And we have the Bible in written form. And we get that opportunity to study and to present it. It is absolutely useless for us to proclaim ourselves as Christians if we do not believe the entirety of that message. The whole of it. 
Deborah expresses his concern with some churches skipping the first portion where we fail God and separate us from Him, separate ourselves from God. And it kind of goes back to the first bullet point, you know, just how broken are we? Boy, totally. We're completely broken. Beyond any type of saving of ourselves. The only salvation we have is through God's mercy and His power. Jonathan Edwards said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. That one is quite powerful for me. Nothing except the sin that made it necessary. So Mark has some questions. You know, do we convey just how broken are we? Or do we convey that? Do we explain the seriousness of our sin? Do we emphasize our need for salvation? Do we show the world just how incredibly amazing the good news is? Because without the contrast of those first questions, that last one is not being proclaimed or shown. And the world thinks they're okay. Deborah's third mark of the gospel. It's because a healthy church will have the whole gospel in their teachings. Mm -hmm. Their evangelism, their prayers, their lives. And Deborah writes, the gospel of Jesus Christ calls for a radical response. The gospel isn't merely an additive that can make our already good lives better. It is a message of wonderful good news for those who know and realize their desperation before God. So what are some of the responses that we're called to have or that we should have to this good news? What are some of those? Is it to fill out a, a card in service and we feel guilty of something or we realize that is that, that part, is that part of it or is lifting up your hand during a final prayer or an altar call that used to be a thing is it necessarily wrong or right but it was a response it was a call to action that many pastors used to do is it to make an appointment with a pastor is that what we're called to do in the gospel is it to make a decision to be baptized and join a church? This is not my question. Though. Any of these things may be involved and aren't necessarily wrong. But the Bible calls us to repent and to believe. Repent is derived from the Greek word matineo. It means to change directions or to change one's way. <clears throat> Repentance is not simply the admission of guilt or having a guilty heart. It is actually allowing that to change you. It is change. That is at the root of its meaning. <clears throat> we are called to change our ways and to believe in Christ and His work on the cross. Jesus instructs us, repent and believe the good news. Mark 1, verse 15. So repentance, how can we get that wrong? How's the world getting that wrong?
than the person who was right. right? So, you know, it's not as simple as feeling bad. That's right. I mean, or as terrible as just feeling bad. Yeah. yeah. I imagine that there are quite a few people who felt guilty over their misdeeds, as they would call them, because if they don't believe they're unbelievers, they might not call it sin. They, that word has been uh, shunned in the, the world community. It's actually, uh, you'll see it being removed in popular phrases now. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. <laughs> That's right. That implies somebody did something wrong. And they'll sugarcoat it and mm -hmm. say it was a different decision. Mm -hmm. So that repentance part is it's huge. Mm -hmm. Something I brought up before Sunday school when we were talking is for people of the world that are in total worldliness and they don't understand sin, um, we can't bring them into the, the doctrine of sin at first. But one of the things we can bring them into is the Ten Commandments, and sin is in breach of those Ten Commandments. And, um, and we don't really hear about that much in churches anymore. How do you tell someone they're a sinner when they don't even know what sin is? That's true. And that does present a very huge hurdle for us now, as opposed to some time in the past, even a short time in the past. You know, and that's going to get more difficult. So we need to pray about that. I mean, is there some ways that we can overcome a lack of knowledge of sin? I mean, if not all of us are evangelists, so our mindset isn't toward that end and, and seeking an answer to that, but it should be. I, I mean, we're going to disciple people, and sometimes we may be blessed with someone in our lives that's an unbeliever that we get to build a close relationship with. And then in those moments, in, those, in that situation, it still applies. And we should find a way, pray for a way, mm -hmm. ask the Holy Spirit to provide a way, ask God to provide a way to present that. Starting with the Ten Commandments is a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Because that shows that we're all sinners. We yes. all broken that God's hand. That's true. And, you know, that, that goes back to where our moral compass is and where the world's moral compass is. You know, we, we have to be careful to make sure that people understand that this isn't our moral compass. <laughs> we're broken like they are, and we need to make sure they know that. Because if they don't believe that we believe we're broken, then why would they believe they are broken? There's a couple of different varieties of false gospel I think already now. Um, but in some sense I don't I don't even know that it's enough to convince somebody um, that they're a sinner as much as it is it, it, it's the consequences of that sin that they have to understand and that we we leave out more than anything else, right? Because even like from like a secular humanist mindset. It's like this growth mindset, or like there's this baseline of like flawed humanity. They'll, they'll, they'll agree readily with you that human beings are flawed, but they believe that you can redeem that through education over time, mm -hmm. and that over time we're gradually getting better and better and better into like the Superman or whatever it is. Right? <laughs> um, so they'll agree with you to some extent that they're flawed or that they make the wrong decision or that maybe even that they're a sinner. If they're by your standard, right? We're borrowing that definition for a second. But it's God's wrath and sin that we're redeemed from. Right. Like it's it's what that sin does when when met by an ultimate sovereign authority. Mm. That, that authority that is determined to judge righteously because yep. he cannot do otherwise. That's what they want to remove. Right. So you, you sin is the first piece, but then you gotta like what's the consequence of that? And, and it, 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 there's a lot of danger you can fall into on a lot of different angles in that, in the sense that like, if you overemphasize one piece over the other, right? Like, um, God didn't, uh, it, it's, the, then there's the question of what God redeemed us to or for, right? And then that gets misrepresented a lot, too. It, we, he redeemed us so that we could 
take over the political culture and impose his law from, from above through civil society. It's false. It's not how any of this has ever worked. Right. Uh, when, it, when it did work, the, the, the church just got corrupted from the inside. So uh, we've seen how that plays out, right? Or he's redeemed us so we could be self-actualized and feel good about ourselves and be a new and improved version of ourselves. We're okay. Right. Yeah, so we're finally okay. Yeah. But we can still go on living separate from him or indifferent to him, right? Also false. It's not it's not the purpose for which we were created. Right. Right. Or he's redeemed us for health, wealth, and prosperity. Right. It's just, it's just to bless us because yeah. he loves us that much and 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 it, it's completely divorced from his purpose. Yeah, if a loving God has all this power, why not treat us all these nice things? Right. So either way, I don't know if that's an answer to anything, but like to, to really give the clear gospel, you need to know redeemed or, or saved from what, for what. You have to really answer those questions accurately. Correct, yes. That's a big deal. Especially for, you know, people that don't want any authority in their lives. They don't want to admit there's a, a you know, a, uh, someone that's going to hold them accountable to something that they don't believe is that big of a deal. I mean, the depravity of their own sin is also a concern. They, they don't understand, you know, just how bad even the little things are. Right. They don't understand that breaking one law is breaking all the law. I mean, you're going against a, a God that is completely holy, and there goes another problem. They don't even understand what it means to be holy. And they think holy is some type of self-righteous, I'm better than you, that mentality, but Truthfully, holiness is <clears throat> one's will to separate themselves from sin and darkness. We're called to be holy, for God is holy. Mm -hmm. And then through Christ and in that effort, we can regain fellowship with God. The uh, having having the right heart for repentance is a big deal. And ultimately, we have to get non-believers or unbelievers to realize and to have that repentance. And sometimes it's not going to happen immediately. I mean, we, we could go back to the parable of the sowers and the seed. We are to sow the seed. And God will provide the increase. He will grow that individual. And if they're in the right soil, they'll grow greatly. So, it... There's an issue there too in our in our evangelism. We have to remove any form of judgment from who we seek out. We can't pick and choose who we present the gospel to based off of desires and concerns of our own. But then we're we're thinking that we're we're part of that growth. We're not. We're not we're not providing the growth there. We're to provide the truth. That truth is painful sometimes. It shouldn't be. Um, we're not getting, I guess, I guess we're heading down the road of evangelism. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. But, yes. Um, and we're sort of departing from the gospel of the two or neck, you know. Oh, yes, together. yes. Um, it's been my experience that people are all over the map. In other words, you, you have to ask them some questions to find out where their heart's at. Yeah, you know, um, do you believe in the afterlife? I don't know, whatever. But there are people, unbelievers, who who don't even recognize God as God, that there is a God. And you know, Paul in, in Romans says they're without excuse. They they know, you know, they're just suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. But it's hard to start with like the Ten Commandments. Well, but that's that's a real good place to start if they're there. If they believe that there is a God, but sometimes you know you gotta, you almost have to start with you know creation and the fact that things were created, and you have to prove that there's a God. But ultimately, you want to get to the point where I think you know you're gonna die one day, you're gonna leave this earth. We have a problem. Something's wrong, and um, they need. I guess it is. Me sharing the gospel with someone, I want them to know that we share a common problem, and we know it can be sin. 
But sometimes that hearer, they don't recognize that yet. Or they, they know something's wrong deep in their heart of hearts. But, you know, they've been fed a whole lot of science. They've been fed a whole, who knows where they're at. But you can find, you know, in, in asking, I say all this because in asking questions, you can find a starting point. It, it, it doesn't do you any good to say, you know, the Bible says if you break these laws that sin, you're going to hell. Well, they may, not, they may say, I don't recognize the Bible. It's just another book. You know what I'm saying? So you almost have to find out where their heart is at right now. Okay. And what, you know, they, they need to get to the point where they're, you can always go to, you know, there is a creator. We're going to die one day. And by the way, the Bible says there'll be a judgment day one day. You know, and uh, there's some things that they need to know that they can agree with. You know, and then you can build it from there. Yeah, Mark is, uh, he, he does include the, uh, the uh, evangelism as a mark. So, and as you said, we're going to be going over that. And, and these are great points. But I want to make sure you guys understand that Mark wants us to make sure that we're getting the gospel right in those moments. Absolutely. And, you know, the watered down churches that we see on TV are leaving out big chunks of it. Uh, and without those parts, the gospel actually isn't good news. It, it, it's barely any news at all to people who don't understand their need. And he's concerned that if, if we're getting that wrong, we're, we're unhealthy. I agree. We're, we would definitely be an unhealthy church if we're getting that wrong. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I think it's important to remember the gospel just isn't for evangelism. Right. You know, I evangelize myself every day because I have to be reminded of the gospel. That's true. I have to speak the gospel to myself every day. So the gospel just isn't meant for unbelievers. Right. The gospel is meant for believers. Right. And Jeff was talking about how we need to ask questions to find out, you know, where they're at in their belief. Because if they're not believers, then that's a different hurdle. I don't think we'll ever convince anyone. No, that's true too. Yeah, and that kind of goes back. About the Holy Spirit right. convincing is falling on deaf ears. Right. The Romans quite clear they've been turned over to the base line. Yes. As God draws us. Yes. Right. That's true. So Deborah wrote. True belief demands not only faith, but also repentance. It demands that our lives actually change. Mm -hmm. J.C. Ryle said, There is a common worldly kind of Christianity in this day, which many have and think they have enough. A cheap Christianity, which offends nobody and requires no sacrifice, which costs nothing, and is worth nothing. I mean, if, if you don't know who J.C. Ryle is, he lived in the 1800s. <laughs> and this statement here sounds like he is preaching it right now. And I'd like, I hate to think what he thought of what he would see today and our societal behavior. But he would probably fall back and say, yeah, this hasn't changed a bit. It's actually gotten worse. The trouble with everyone taking offense is that being offended is usually selfish. Instead of worrying about what offends God, man worries about what offends himself. And these cheap Christians, as J.C. Ryle describes, will worry more about offending the selfish sons of Adam instead of what offends God. Real repentance and actual belief in the gospel are connected with action and with change. And Deborah wrote, we change the way we act, but only because we change what we believe. And it kind of goes back to our involvement and how we are to be part of the story. If people see a change, if they see us working toward this end, they're going to see that we believe because those those are linked, the action and the belief. I'm curious how would we define belief as a group here? How would we define right. belief? Right, that's a good question. Uh, that's something we should be asking ourselves constantly. It kind of goes back to presenting the gospel to ourselves daily and reminding ourselves just how broken and how 
blessed we are with God's mercy. Pastor Bob, this is the word, um, the Greek word for belief. Um, Still? Yeah, it has the idea of reliance upon trusting. Yeah, I, um, I think that there's a, it's a big question that Bell already ran, but um, I think there's an intellectual content, a um, volitional content, and another one that I can't remember right now, to, to biblical belief. Um, I, have to, I have to know the truths of, of the, the, in my head about my sin and Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Um, but, but knowing it intellectually all by itself is not enough. There's a, a like I try to say from the pulpit from time to time, when I believe in somebody, it's not just something I believe about them. There's a willingness, there's an understanding of, of my um, my responsibility to, to commit to something. When I believe, like the, the stuff I said over and over again last week, I think. If I believe in, and Larry's my mechanic, I commit my car to him. I really trust him. If I believe in Jesus as my Savior, I, I, if I believe in Larry, I believe that my, my car isn't running. <laughs> it needs to get fixed. And so I commit it to the God who can fix it. If I believe in Jesus as my Savior, I know that before God, I'm guilty. I'm lost. I can't fix this. So here I am. Here's my guilt, Lord God. Do what you alone can do. So I commit myself to Him. And there's also a, a, an element, I think, of, of submission. Um, I, I, I believe, Larry tells me, you've got to have a new water pump. That's why it's leaking. Okay. I'm, I'm, I submit to his decision, and there's a sense in which I do that with Jesus when I believe in him as my Savior. I commit myself to him, and, and I'm his. Yes. I don't know if that helps or not. Oh, greatly. I mean, that's a, that's a big part of it, and if we get that wrong, as you've already said, we're not believing in the manner in which we're called to believe. Because yeah. belief does require change and a uh, commitment. I think the Bible uses the word trust. Trust. Yes, that's a great word too. Trust. Yes. Right. We're trusting in what Christ has done and His work. Yes. The Bible points out that uh, belief of works. What do you believe? Say belief of works. If he was doing saving people. He was bringing the sick to the cult and all these things. So yes. But as the Bible says that sometimes you have faith in something. The, the, the works are here. It's being proven by history. You have to believe in Abraham. He believed in God. And was not right. righteous. Why? Because he brought child for a burned woman. He never even imagined his old age that could bear uh, children for that. Right, yes. So there's a difference between, between believing in the existence of Christ and his power and believing in his, his ministry and his work and what he has came to do. And that's a big, big difference. And the world doesn't understand how important that difference is. And when Christ calls us to believe, he's not talking about in his physical being. He's talking about in his work and what he's doing and what he's going to do, what he has done. And if we believe that this, the Son of God has came and fulfilled the law perfectly, died for us, and was resurrected and lives again, and we believe that is how we're saved. That's the belief we're talking about. We're not talking about the existence of God or His power. We're talking about in His work and His salvation and God's plan for our salvation. We had a friend who was a Bible translator in Indonesia for finding Bible translators, and there are hundreds of tribes in Indonesia different dialects. And when he discussed this one translation, the word that the tribe had for belief was to put your whole weight upon. I always thought that was just an excellent That is a good excellent word, yes. I mean, it's one thing to put your foot on it, but it's another to just commit completely your entire weight to that. We need complete, we can commit our entire lives to Christ. Mm. I mean, that's a Amen. That's a thing. That's, that's the... Uh, we do that so that the world will see the works going coming through us. Our faith is important to the unbelievers because if they don't believe we believe, 
They, why would they believe? They're not. So our own faith is, is crucial to presenting the gospel. And we need to believe and teach the whole gospel in its fullness. And I'll leave one question. Ken had a concern about, you know, what are we doing here? And what are we doing in our homes? To study and to focus on the entirety of the gospel. And to make sure that we're not missing any parts of it. Now, we're run out of time. And I really enjoyed your guys' involvement, discussion, questions, and input. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll close this with a prayer now. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to understand what we've done, Lord. And we thank you for giving us the ability through the Holy Spirit to understand that and to receive that knowledge. It's one thing, Lord, to simply know the Bible and know all the teachings there, but it's another to understand it. And to understand it Understand your teachings through the lens of the gospel, through the lens of what Christ has done. It's a big difference, and it's profound. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. And your love for us is so, so obvious. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray that we take that news, we, we allow it to change us, and spread through the world. And I, I pray that we take it into every aspect of our lives. And in this name, in your name, we pray. Amen. Amen.